That's why for the awliya, the, the people who are very spiritual, right, those people are well spiritually nourished and connected, they enjoy their salat more than anything else in this world. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa even though he's been forg- forgiven and he can't do any wrong really, he's the most beloved of Allah, he loves it in prayer. He stands for hours on end till his feet become swollen. How does he do that? Why does he do that? He does it in the privacy of his home. He didn't do that in the masjid. In the masjid, it's the fard prayer. He does that as, you know, the normal amount, the average amount. But the long prayers that he's doing is doing privately in his house. So it's not to teach anybody or to show anybody in that direct sense. That's his enjoyment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we, unfortunately, we, we don't enjoy because we have too many other distractions to, we've got too much competition. There's a lot of other things that we can do to compete with our spirituality. So literally today, we're living in a time where our spirituality is being destroyed because we're not being given a chance. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'ina amma ba'd. My dear brothers, nice to be in your midst today. Uh, for this after Asr program. When we come into this world, we're taught certain basic things. We come into the world knowing how to cry. We come into the world knowing how to ingest food and take food down, take milk down. We have certain physiological and physical capabilities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends us into this world with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also sends us down with a few other things that normally a lot of people cannot see. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Kullu mawludin yuladu ala al-fitrah. Every child that's born is born on the fitrah. A uh, lot of people mistake this and say a lot of, uh, that everybody is born a Muslim. Uh, the word Muslim means to submit. And... Uh, that's another idea. So fitra means on the nature. And the nature here means that we have been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we're the makhluk of Allah, the creation, the created beings of Allah. So he's obviously programmed us and put an environment within our minds that we can easily accept guidance. In fact, the test or the research that has done to show that Anybody who has not been affected by taking on some kind of other object of worship, they will end up usually worshipping a superior being. Anything. We're all inherently programmed to submit to something. Even secularists would, a lot of secularists would say that we submit to something. This question is what do you submit to? So we're all born to submit to a higher realm, a higher, higher being. Now, everybody can see what babies need as they're growing up and what children need as they're growing up, infants, children, and so on. We also need spirituality because spirituality is the aspect of our life because our life is made up of our body and our spirit. There's two aspects. But the whole focus for a lot of people is on the body because it's so evident, it's so apparent It's the body that you're going to feel and touch. It's the body that you're going to see. It's the body that you're going to feed. It's the body that is going to fight with you. If a punch comes, it's going to be from the body. So everything is related to the body, so our entire focus goes on the body. So then we indulge, and in the times that we're living in, we've never had in history as much facility and products to foster our body and embellish our body and adorn our body and nourish our body and enhance our bodies as before. We've never had that before. Before only women had makeup, now men can have makeup as well. That was missing, that's come there as well. That's there available as well. You want to change your skin tone and skin color, you can do that as well. So all the focus is on that. The whole focus becomes on the body. 
The thing is that the body is only for this world. At least this body is only for this world. A, a, small, a small part of our body, the bottom of the backbone, as mentioned in the hadith, is, gonna, is, going, to, uh, is, is, go, is going to carry on. So when, when we eventually die, and whether you're buried into the ground or otherwise, or cremated or in any other way that people are disposed of or um, uh, basically let go from this world, then ultimately we're moving into the hereafter. When you move into the hereafter, our Muslim belief is, is that Allah will create a new body for us. On the day of judgment, a new body will be created, a fresh body from the part of our body that was left. A small part, whether that's a part that contains its DNA or whatever it is, a very small part will be left, even if we've decomposed. A small part will be left. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us from nothing. We'll be able to recreate us from that with absolutely... Uh, uh, no effort whatsoever. That's going to be our body for the hereafter, and that body is not going to change. That's going to be an unchanging body. It's going to be, if you go to paradise, it's going to be between 30 to 33 years, old, years of age. That's kind of the peak, right? That's kind of the peak where it's fully developed now, and it's going to be completely <coughs> strong and powerful and will remain like that in paradise. And unfortunately, if somebody has to go to hellfire, well, they will be punished with their body, and it will be very, very sensitive to take in the pain and to, to, to have to basically feel the pain and the agony. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect. Now the part of our life, so the body is secondary in that sense, but we make it primary. Our real focus should be on the soul because that soul is going to carry on into the next life. And this soul which now occupies this body is going to occupy the body of the hereafter. The soul is also what's going to, the soul is going to become primary in the grave because the body may not be there, just a small fragment will be remaining. But the soul will be there and the soul is what takes in the punishment, if there is any in the grave, or the pleasure and the joys of the grave. So the soul becomes immortal. Then in the hereafter we get a new body. Right? And the body and the soul both are equal in the hereafter. In the world, the body is stronger than the soul because we focus more on it as well. In the grave, it's primarily the soul because the body is secondary. Whether the body is there or not, our soul will feel the experiences. And in the hereafter, it will be body and soul and they both will be equal. So that's why the pleasure that we will get in paradise will be unlike any pleasure you'll ever feel here because you're feeling it fully, not just through your body, but your soul as well. So now what gives us success in the hereafter is going to be focusing on the soul and the spirituality. That is what spirituality is. Because the topic uh, that was kept for this program was spirituality in Islam or something like that, right? So I thought, let me check the topic and then let me speak according to the topic because I like to keep on, to the, on the topic. So spirituality in Islam. So what exactly is spirituality? Spirituality is, just think about it this way, you know how much we look after and focus on our physical body that we feed it. You have to, if you don't feed it. There's a guy who just came out of prison. He was put into a prison in Palestine for three months. He comes out after three months and you can see he, his eyes have sunken and so on because he's been deprived of food. Allah relieve our brothers and sisters down there. But what I'm trying to say is that if you don't feed our body with a certain amount of nourishment, right? A certain basic amount of nourishment, we look, don't look after ourselves, we don't look after our skin, crack skin and so on, then it starts deteriorating. In the extreme cold or something, you have eczema, you have different things, we have to look after it. You have to give it medicine, you have to put ointment on it, you have to stay in the warm, you, you, it shouldn't be too cold, it shouldn't be too hot, and so on and so forth. Our heart requires the same kind of focus. But very little focus is, goes on the heart. So then what happens with the heart is that although we're moving, the heart dies. And Allah mentions this multiple places in the Quran. They have a dead heart. They have a heart that doesn't understand anymore. They have hearts that they just don't, un they don't understand and comprehend with it. They might have an intellect that they use, but because they have no heart, it can't be guided properly. The part of the heart is important to guide the way people think. That's why it's very important to think with the heart as well and to focus on the heart. Now, uh, if, we, if we look at the Quran and Sunnah, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, what the Prophet mentioned regarding the heart, 
ala bi dhikrillahi tatma innu al-qulub a lot of the time we're in turbulent we're in a turbulent mode we're we're, we're not calm we're not focused a lot of people have depression they very they have a lot of anxiety uh, they can't function in this life because they can't function their body can't function they may still be eating and so on but they're becoming sick they're becoming ill they're feeling miserable and so on so a lot of people say do some more dhikr of allah now dhikr of allah is always useful because that gives the heart some nourishment but there's another aspect of the heart which is very important that is besides the dhikr of allah dhikr of allah is important for sure but what else is important is to understand and focus the heart in the right direction and have the right information in there if you don't understand the way of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world and what allah wants with the human beings with us in this world and how to deal with calamities for example how to deal with prosperity and happiness and abundance then we're going to really go wrong in that regard and depression i think is more of an issue of perspective and narrative and understanding rather than just an absence of dhikr so not only do you know do you need the dhikr of allah which helps to revive the heart but you also need the right understanding of how to live and what to do in this place in the physical body everybody tells us you know as young kids they go to a, a, your, your auntie's house and say, look, look look make sure you put your coat on properly so the cold doesn't get you everybody talks about that but very few people tell you like you know have you uh, how's your heart today and it looks like there's an issue even though we see some people with a lot of mischief with a lot of evil it's very difficult to even tell them about that so there are diets to do with that there are diets to do with the heart and that's very very important for us to understand that is exactly what spirituality is as simple as that now let's take it on another level right Allah subhanahu uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that this world will not end will not end until somebody is saying Allah 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 meaning as long as Allah's name is being taken this world doesn't end and will not end when there's nobody to take the name of Allah all the muslims believers will be gone and there's hardly anybody left to take the name of Allah that's when the earth will end because it's lost its nourishment it will die because of the loss of its nourishment the nourishment of this world the sustenance of this world the food of this world is the the dhikr and the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's the entire world this masjid will prosper because of the remembrance of Allah if there's no remembrance of Allah left here this will become dilapidated we know that for sure anyway because what is a masjid without the name of Allah likewise every single house every single business cannot prosper in the correct sense you may make a lot of money but that money is not going to have much weight and much bang in terms of the spiritual aspect unless you have some remembrance of Allah and halal focus there if the whole world on a macro level sustains itself by the remembrance of Allah then on a micro level every single human being and every single business every single home and every single other place also nourishes itself with the remembrance of Allah that's why when you're praying at home as well the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in fact said that don't exclusively pray in the masjid he didn't say in those words he said that don't make your homes into graveyards ya rasulullah what does that mean right what does that mean that don't make your homes graveyards uh, one of the main meanings there is that don't just pray elsewhere for example and not pray anything at home because your home also needs the barakah that comes from praying and the blessing that comes you see whenever we remember allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's a there's a great scholar of egypt great uh, spiritual scholar of egypt his name was imam sha'rani rahimahullah he has some adab he mentioned some adab of uh, remembering allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i'm not going to go into all of them right now but one thing that i really learned from him was that once you finish the remembrance of allah any kind of remembrance of allah when you finish remembering whether that be salat or some tasbihat or whatever when you finish don't just get up and and move away he said sit hold your breath and just relax for a while why he said because 
what I've understood from there, what he's saying essentially is that when you remember Allah, you're invoking a huge amount of mercy and blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The angels and everyone else, as the hadith mentions, that when somebody reads the Quran, then the angels, they, they surround them. The tranquility and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala envelopes them. So when you finish, you want to make sure that all of these waves that you've created of spirituality, the spiritual waves that you've created, you actually benefit from them. You take them in, you absorb them rather than creating them and walking away. SubhanAllah. So that's why we have after salat, you know, we have, you sit down, you do some tasbihat. Right? Now, when we pray, for example, in the masjid or anywhere for that matter, we have just remembered Allah. Somewhere or the other, I mean, multiple ways actually, because salat is probably the most comprehensive collection of the different types of remembrances of Allah as they are. If you go into a toy shop, right, you put a child in a toy shop, and there's more toys that you can play in a day. I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. Just imagine a huge toy shop. Right? That's why for the awliya, the, the people who are very spiritual, right, those people are well spiritually nourished and connected, they enjoy their salat more than anything else in this world. The Prophet ﷺ, even though he's been forg- forgiven and he can't do any wrong really, he's the most beloved of Allah, he loves it in prayer. He stands for hours on end till his feet become swollen. How does he do that? Why does he do that? He does it in the privacy of his home. He didn't do that in the masjid. In the masjid, it's the fard prayer. He does that as, you know, the normal amount, the average amount. But the long prayers that he's doing, is doing privately in his house. So it's not to teach anybody or to show anybody in that direct sense. That's his enjoyment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we... Unfortunately, we, we don't enjoy because we have too many other distractions to... We've got too much competition. There's a lot of other things that we can do to compete with our spirituality. So literally today, we're living in a time where our spirituality is being destroyed. Because we're not being given a chance. If you've got that moment, you know, it's like, I need to check that new message out, that new reel out, that new Instagram out, that new YouTube video that's come out. Yes, it's about Palestine, it's about Gaza, but that's all we do. So the Prophet Sallallahu would enjoy it, would enjoy it. That's why I remember just some years ago sitting with this Waliullah and he said that our madrasa, we insist that we have gatherings of dhikr, tasbihat, etc. Because if the whole world can sustain itself, then why not? Then, then why not a building be sustained, an, an academy, right? A duha academy or institute, or these places, why can't they be? And alhamdulillah, that, that's, that's what we need to do. That's why one of the most beautiful ways is that if you have somebody doing memorization of the Qur'an, a child who's memorizing the Qur'an, you've got two in the house who are doing that, they're praying Qur'an for hours, mashallah. Look, all that barakah. You've got all the people who are retired, and now mashallah, they're doing their salat with tasbih, and their tahajjud prayer, and their ishraq prayer, and this many juz every day, outside and inside of Ramadan, Allahu Akbar, those homes are blessed. If we're busy doing work, I'm saying, we should be doing that as well. That those women who are in the houses, who've made it a habit that when they are cooking, they are remembering Allah. There are many women who do this, by the way. Just spoke to a brother some time ago, he said his wife, she, she is constantly doing some dhikr when she is cooking the food. That food is going to be full of barakah and blessing. Spirituality in that home is going to grow. It's the way we maintain ourselves. That's our maintenance. So that is essentially spirituality. Otherwise we die. Otherwise the heart dies. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, a lot of people who come and they say that, you know, we just don't feel like doing anything. It's miserable. We have so much of the dunya, but it's miserable. There's no enjoyment in the world. There's no enjoyment in what we do. Even though we've got more than we ever need in terms of uh, physical goods and assets. But there's, there's not much else that we're getting out of this. We're not feeling satisfied with everything. I've got five cars, but I don't feel good about it. What's really interesting is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. وَمَنْ يَعْشُ عَنْ ذِكْرِ الرَّحْمَانِ نُقَيِّدْ لَهُ شَيْطَانًا فَهُوَ لَهُ قَرِينٌ Whoever remains away, uh, isolated 
from the remembrance of Allah, then we designate a shaitan with them, for them, who becomes a very, very close, intimate associate. Now remember, all of us have been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and every single human being that's been created in this world, right? As soon as they're created, there's a shaitan that is attached to them. So they asked the Prophet sallallahu even you, Ya Rasulullah. He said, yes, even me as a human being, but my shaitan has submitted. His shaitan can't do anything to him, right? And if shaitans could be Muslim, that shaitan would be Muslim. That is one reading of it as well. Right? My shaitan has been submitted. He can't do anything to me because prophets are divinely protected from the shaitan. You can't have shaitan mess with prophets. Prophets are pure guidance and shaitan can't adulterate and corrupt prophets. So everybody has a shaitan. Now, it's not one shaitan for the Khan family and one shaitan for the Chaudhrys, right? And one shaitan maybe for the people from Atak and another one for the people from, you know, who speak Saraiki or, you know what I mean? It's not like that. It's every single individual. It's not even word per family. He's Farigewa. Is one per family, uh, per, per individual. And that shaitan, because he's been with us since birth, he knows everything about us. He's been throughout our life, he knows exactly what makes us tick, what makes us mess up, what disturbs us, what tempts us, what distracts us, and what makes us heedless. He gives us ideas. So, in order to get stronger spirituality, we have to develop immunity from the shaitan. How do you develop immunity from the shaitan? To get better spirituality, because shaitan is who's disturbing our spirituality. It doesn't want you to pray. It doesn't want you to go to the masjid to pray. It doesn't want you to pray in jama'ah. And then if you do get there, then he distracts you in the prayer, so you don't fully take part and take the full blessing of that prayer. He's the one who makes people argue with others to spoil our life and spirituality because one of the biggest disturbers and detrimental factors to our spirituality is when we take somebody else's rights or when, you, when we have a conflict with somebody. That really destroys even your prayer because in your prayer you're thinking about what you're going to say to your so-called enemy. So all of these things are destroyers. All of these things are destroyers. That's what shaitan's job is to make us do. So... That shaitan is, uh, is there trying to tempt us around and we need to develop immunity. Now, I don't know, uh, let, let's think about a time, right? When if there is a certain vice, a certain wrong that is difficult for a person to avoid. But then do you remember a time when for a few weeks after, for example, an Umrah session, after a certain program you went to, after you read a certain book, after Hajj, after... Uh, after going out in jama'at, tabligh, whatever it is, that you felt immune to that issue for at least a few weeks or even a few months and you didn't even think about it. You know, when uh, a lot of Muslims, most Muslims, when they go into a supermarket and they like shopping, they go to every aisle, they check out the new products and everything, there's two or three aisles that they can avoid. They don't even have to go there, hey, let me just check it out at least. No, you don't bother. What are those aisles? The wine aisles, right? The wine, the beer, all of that stuff. You don't even have to go there because there's no switch on for that, hopefully. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to go there because I might get tempted. It's not, like, I don't need to go there. I don't need to check what the price is. I don't even know what the price is of a bottle of wine or champagne. I don't need to know, right? It's just not within my vocabulary. Right? So if, if uh, towards sins, that could be our attitude that we don't even feel like it. It doesn't even cross our mind. No temptation. That would be wonderful. The only way that can happen is to develop spirituality. When the spirituality is low, that means our iman is low. You could say low spirituality is low iman. Though we believe in everything, but our spirituality is low, so our iman is low. So we're, we, we don't have immunity, so we're constantly picking up viruses. So if you have good immunity, you won't easily catch a cold. Right? If, it's, if, there's, if there's such an idea, you know, there is some level of that idea there. So likewise, when it comes to these things, it's the same kind of thing. The more we develop our spirituality, the more our shaitan will submit, will calm down, know that it's not worth it. Or he can't do it as much as he wants. As for other people. 
So that is spirituality. And the way to gain spirituality is by doing a few things, right? We don't have too much time. And uh, maybe, uh, you know, I can open it up uh, for a few questions afterwards uh, if you have some time. But the way to develop spirituality is to get to know Allah and to start loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is literally the only way. There is nothing else. There is nothing in this world that if you become attached to. So let's put it this way. Anything in this world, anything, anything. That if you become attached to it, you will eventually feel pain. Because you're either going to lose that thing. Or that thing is going to, if it's a car, it, it eventually is going to end. It's going to go, it's going to break down. If it's a person, they might die. Or they might decide to go elsewhere. They might decide to break up with you. Or they may become sick and ill. You will become... Because anything you have full attachment to in this world, ultimately is going to give you some pain. The only thing that doesn't give you pain in this world is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to become attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That doesn't mean that you can't be attached to a certain degree with anything else that we're allowed to be attached to, like our parents and our children and our spouse and the masjid and so on and so on. But the masjid is Allah, right? The masjid is attachment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you do these things for the sake of Allah. Now, the only way that a person can develop their spirituality is to learn more about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because remember, I said that a lot of people who are depressed, their reason for depression is not necessarily low dhikr. Because I know people who are depressed who've been praying all their life. But I think what it really is, is their misunderstanding of Allah. Misunderstanding of the events of this life. Misunderstanding of how things work in this world. And how they're supposed to deal with these issues. With the ch different challenges that come up. How are you supposed to deal with them? If you don't have that perspective, then your dhikr, your worship won't even be proper. If your worship, is pro your worship can be augmented and enhanced by having the, a proper opinion of what Allah exactly wants and how He wants it. Because, so we need to understand Allah and we need to understand what He wants from us. And the best way to do that, the absolute best way to do that is by reading the Qur'an. Not just completing a few Qur'ans in Ramadan every year. But literally understanding what Allah is telling us. Yes, it's open to you and I and everybody else. It's not just for scholars. Now, I'm not doing this to make anybody guilty or to condemn anybody. But let, let's just get an idea of how many people have read the Quran once over with meaning to understand what Allah is telling them. At least once in their life. MashaAllah, five, six, seven, eight. This is the first time that I've had literally, I mean, it's a very small group, but this is the first time I've had actually about half the people to do that. Usually it's about 5%. Right? So there's something going on in this Duha Institute. All right? There's something going on. The whole Quran I'm talking about, right? Because the, 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 this is uncommon. I'm so happy to hear this. Right? A Duha Institute just, uh, uh, what do you call it, excites me because it's uh, just like white thread. And white thread is essentially the white thread of dawn, the Duha. A Duha al-Sadiq, right? So alhamdulillah. If, when you read the Quran with meaning, not to, I mean, the, the purpose of it, not to start giving fatwas, right? And call yourself a scholar is just to understand what our maker wants from us. That's literally what it is. And... It's amazing, his discussion. He tells you what he wants, what he likes, what he dislikes, what he gives, what he has given, uh, his warnings, how he punishes and how he rewards, how clement he is, how beautiful he is, how magnificent he is, how generous he is, how powerful he is, how forgiving he is, how benevolent he is and how generous and kind that he is. And it just drives you. It just drives. The Quran is written in that way to drive somebody. But unfortunately, most people uh, don't understand what the Quran means. They don't get a translation if they're not Arabic, you know, Arab to understand Arabic. They don't, they don't do that. That is the best way to get an understanding of the Quran. Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that's his words. You know, sometimes you read a, a book of an author and you, get, you think you get to know the author. Problem is that authors can make up stuff. Right? And make themselves out to be different, different in their writing than who they are. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is transparent. He is who He is. He says it is. He doesn't have to worry about it. He's not trying to play a game with anybody. He's very, very honest 
and clear and he, he, wants, he wants himself to be known. That's number one. Number two, uh, on another level, although this, you find this in the Quran, but to separate it out is to focus on the names of Allah. Get a collection, a translation, you know, of the 99 names of Allah. And just go through them. Just calmly go through them. If you find a little book with a commentary that explain what each of those names are, that's even better. You just go through them. Why should you go through them? To understand who Allah is. Now, I don't know many people here, right? But if I know you by name, right? Like, what's your name? Mumtaz. Mumtaz, and you are? So you're Ibrahim, and he's the distinctive one. Mumtaz, like he stands out because he's Mumtaz, right? Which means Imtiaz, and you are Ibrahim, the, the, uh, the, the, the servant of God, right? The son of Allah in Hebrew. So I just call you by your name, and that's good enough. Right? I mean, you'd be happy with that. But if I find out who you are, what you're good at, and I don't know you, I need to get to know you more. If I, if I get to know who you are, right? And then I address you by that, that, oh, you know, you're an expert in this. You're going to feel much more validated. You're going to feel like, yes, the guy knows me, he just doesn't know me as Ibrahim or Mumtaz. Like, he knows me, like, he knows more about me. It's like, okay, you know? So with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we call on him by just Allah. That's fine. It's great. That's one of the most powerful names. But we want to do the 99 names. And the benefit is that what you do when you're going through the 99 names is you will pick out a few that are relevant to life for you at that point. So if we are seeking forgiveness, then uh, we will write down and separate out the ones about forgiveness. If we're struggling, wealth is mughni and al-ghani, for example. Dhul Jalali wal Ikram. If we're suffering uh, in terms of, you know, uh, somebody is doing us wrong, Ya Muntaqim, right? And we really want to avenge ourselves or something like that. There's a name for everything, right? There's a name for everything. Um, we produced a really beautiful copy of this dua book. It's one of the most wonderful dua books out there because it literally has all the duas that you need in your life, whether you realize it or not. It's a dua book that if you complete, even take three months to complete, and you do it three or four times a year, if not every week, right? You would have asked Allah for everything that we need for the success of this world and the hereafter. That's how comprehensive that book is. So we'd produced the Arabic edition because people were reading, but then everybody wanted a translation. So then I worked on the translation from 2019, 2021, and got it done in 2021, and then I couldn't publish it. Because I am too obsessed by design and making sure it's right. And it looks so, because for a beautiful book like that, it had to be right. And finally, um, it just was, I was like, look, the book is ready and I'm wasting it now. It should go out to people and people should benefit from it, inshallah. So after this last Ramadan, I sat down and I said, you know what? I need to make a special dua so that I can finally agree and be satisfied with the design. So... I said, what do I call unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with, right? So now tell me, out of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which one is related to design and beauty? So one is musawwir. Musawwir means the fashioner, the, the, the one who designs something, the one who makes a form out of something. Yusawwirukum fil arham. Allah, he makes your form in the wombs, right? What else is there that's relevant to that? What other name is relevant? Malikul Mulk is definitely relevant, but on a much more broader. Malikul Mulk means the owner of, on the, the sovereign of you know, the whole kingdom. Talk more about design, specifically to do with design. If any graphic artist out there, it'll help you as well. That's getting closer, right? The innovator. Something more to do with design in particular. Anybody? Jamil. Jamil. In Allah, Jamilun Yuhibbul Jamal. Allah is beautiful and elegant and He loves elegance and beauty. Anyway, I sat with my wife on fr in front of the screen to find the right background. That was what was bothering me. I couldn't f find the right background to you know, provide the, the, the right kind of look. Uh, I made a dua, Ya Musawwir, and so on. Ya Allah, make this easy. Within five minutes, I had a background, which I was happy with finally. It's amazing, you call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah loves it when, you, when somebody recognizes him. Because that's, how, that's why he created us. Otherwise, he did not need all of this. 
at all. He doesn't need it, in fact. He said, I want to do it so I be, I, I be known, recognized. And spirituality is essentially ma'rifah of Allah. Allah loves it when somebody knows him. He's willing to give you anything as long as you can say, as long as you turn to him and you show you know him. That's what Allah wants from us. So take the names of Allah and just find some and then read them again after a few weeks and you'll find something else that's going on in your life at another name. For example, if you, we take tablets for something, uh, ointment you put for something. When you do that, you say, Ya Shafi, you call on to him with that name of Kiora. And that will just be a lot more effective. Okay, number three. Uh, number, the third way of getting spirituality, knowing Allah, is to sit with somebody of spirituality. To see how they lead their life. What spirituality is in their life. How do they th- do things that are full of spirituality? Because once you become a spiritual person, everything about you becomes spiritual. The way you talk, the way you think, the way you address yourself, everything becomes for the sake of Allah. That is becoming a spiritual individual. So when we sit with somebody, we learn. If you can't sit with somebody, read their books. That means a wali Allah. Find a shaykh that you can go and sit in their company. And number four is to have a certain amount of dhikr that you do by repeating the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiple times. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is willing. Because remember that every name, that you, uh, every remembrance that you do of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it provides you life. It nourishes you. It's your food. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَثَلُ الَّذِي يَذْكُرُ رَبَّهُ وَالَّذِي لَا يَذْكُرْ كَمَثَلِ الْحَيِّ وَالْمَيِّتِ The one who remembers Allah and the one who doesn't is like the dead and living person. Or the living and the dead person. The one who remembers Allah is the living one and the one who doesn't remember Allah is the dead one because their hearts are dead. Their physical bodies are perfect. They could be going gym every day and working out, eating really, really particular foods and very careful, but they're not focused on their heart. And as Muslims, that's what makes us distinct from anybody else. Why is it that after 70 years of persecution, after literally every building, nearly every building there being bombed. How do people still not complain? That is absolutely amazing. How do they still, they've just lost two children, they've lost 40 members of their family, and they're still willing to say, no, we're going to carry on. Hasbun Allahu wa ni'mal wakil. Allah is sufficient for us. Allah is sufficient for us, and He's the best patron. It's the only way is you develop. And in hardship, if you've got your thought right, then the hardship can actually become hugely beneficial for you. We're not looking for hardships, but if you do have hardship and you deal with it, the way that accelerates our spirituality and gets us higher is like nothing else. In fact, sometimes Allah gives hardship to people who know how to deal with it to accelerate them faster than if they had done worship. Their worship can't take them as fast as the sabr that they do. The Prophet ﷺ was put through so many hardships. At the end of his life, the last few days, right? We've just uh, discussed that on Zamzam Academy as well, the last few days of the Prophet's life. He was put through so much difficulty in the sense of the fevers that he, he got that his daughter was so worried about him. He said, don't worry about it. After this, there'll be no pain for your father. This is just the end of the world because this world is just the temporary place that we're here to do. And Allah wanted him to be even in a higher place. He puts him through those difficulties of the last moments as well. You're going from this world anyway. Just go through some more difficulty. But then your reward in the hereafter and your status in the hereafter will be elevated and raised. So that, that, that's how it is. So just to actually conclude, spirit, a lot of people don't focus on their spiritual well-being, their spiritual heart though they do focus on their bodies. And the whole world is focused on everybody's bodies because they want to make money from everybody. Right? The spiritual heart, the spiritual aspect has to, be, has to be developed for us to be successful in this world, get contentment and happiness and joy and satisfaction in this world and of course success in the hereafter. And the way to do that is to get to know Allah better and to remember Allah. And the, way, the best way to do that is by reading the Qur'an. 
And number two is by the 99 names of Allah. And number three is to find somebody who knows Allah and try to learn from them by being in their company, by sitting with such people or reading about them at least. And the last one, not necessarily the last one, but the fourth one here is having a dhikr regimen, an amount of dhikr that we do every day. And of course, we continue to read the hadith and so on to give us better understanding of how the Prophet ﷺ put these things into action. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase our spirituality and uh, Allah ta'ala bless us. Jazakallah khair for this opportunity. And um, yes, if you have any questions, we can uh, take those inshallah. So spirituality is a positive state in the remembrance of Allah. Now, if we're arguing people uselessly, sometimes you might have to argue for the right reason, but that's going to be hardly seldom. Most of the arguments that people have that is over petty issues. What that does is that that takes over your mind. You can't argue and then forget about it the next moment, can you? You're then conniving and thinking and your response and everything. That's going to take time away from your remembrance of Allah. Yes, if somebody thinks during that, no, I can't do this. I want to give this up for the sake of Allah. That's spirituality. But otherwise, arguments get drawn out and they just corrupt our heart. They take over our heart. That's how it goes against uh, the spirituality arguments. There's a lot of, and sins, of course, they do. Like the Prophet ﷺ said that a fornicator does not fornicate while he's a believer. What does that mean? Are you a kafir at that point? No, it just means that the iman, according to one hadith, comes out. And then it comes back in when you finish. Same thing has been said about stealing. Same thing has been said about drinking. The iman comes out. The iman leaves and departs and comes back afterwards. You know, that is one understanding of that hadith. So you can, tell what, you can tell what all of these things do to our spirituality. And spirituality is our iman. The diseases of the heart are obviously those things that are violating our spirituality. Because diseases of the heart are what's going to make us think wrong. And do things wrong and have the wrong perspective. So the diseases of the heart are things like hatred for the wrong reasons, uh, excessive anger. Right? That's a disease of the heart. In fact, a shortcoming in anger, the faculty of anger. You need a bit of oomph in your life and a bit of power in your life. Because if you have no anger at all, that's not a good thing. Because then you're not willing to even defend yourself or your faith or your family for that matter. <clears throat> too much desire, too much indulgence, too much ego, too much arrogance and pride. Showing off, wanting to be known, you know, just to be famous. Vanity, jealousy, not being contented with what Allah has given you. And always wanting more even though you've literally got more than... 90% of the world, right? And in England, alhamdulillah, most of us, majority of us, live a life style that is the lifestyle of the top 10% of the world. You know, with the facilities that we have and the security we have and the access that we have to different products and whatever else there is. You go to any other country, even countries of where a lot of people here come from, is rough around the edges, you know, is not the same. The very wealthy, they indulge, but otherwise not there. We have access to these things. Even a medium uh, person here has access to 10%, literally the top 10% of the luxuries of this world. So when you're not satisfied, and uh, if you're stingy. So all of these are the blameworthy hearts, uh, blameworthy traits of the heart. They need to be replaced. They need to be worked on. Yeah, so some depression. I won't say all depression because I've seen people who are depressed without uh, being very consumer oriented right being consumerism you know they're not into consumerism but that is definitely one thing that people are depressed because they see other people in their locality who have you know x number of cars or uh, th th this many other investments and business thing why can't even though they're, they're quite satisfied i i just listened to somebody who said that when they were making a huge amount of money he said that he had i don't know uh, 15 or 17 cars right in in his garage or house or whatever. I mean, can you imagine the size of his house then if you've got 15, 16 cars, right? But he said, eventually, right, I did that. But eventually, and this, this is not even a very religious person I'm talking about, just a worldly person who has come out of that now, right? He said, eventually they all became 
they became a burden, a liability, because I can't even drive all of them. I can only drive one at one time. But all of them need to be driven so that they can be maintained. You have to tax them, you have to look after them, MOT them. I mean, who's going to do all of that hassle? And once you've got, you know, a nice car, then behind the wheel, it's all the same afterwards. To be honest, if you look at it today, if you do have a special car, you're probably not using the majority of the features in there that you've paid for. How many of you have a four-wheel drive, right? But you're never going to need it because you don't even do off-roading. You don't live in very hilly areas either. You know what I'm trying to say? I remember I was looking for the car, so one of them had, uh, near the steering wheel, they had these paddles that you can change the gears with, and the other one didn't. Somebody said, look, that doesn't have that. I said, I'm never going to use those. But yeah, yeah, let me just get that as a feature. I may need it one day. And the car companies know this. So a lot of the stuff in there that you get today, majority will not even use most of that. But because you can get it, and it just feels good to have it, and because it makes it better than uh, it's the next class up, it's the next model up, you just want to get it because you just think you need it. Th this is what's killing a lot of people. My, my advice usually is, you know what? Be functional in this world and practical. Be functional in this world. What that means is that get an expensive product if it provides a function for you, if you really need it. But if you don't need it, then suffice with whatever you do need, don't get it for somebody else. So I know somebody who, very wealthy guy, he wants to buy me an iPhone. Like he looks at me and he's like, I need to get you an iPhone, you need to have an iPhone. I said, I don't want an iPhone. He's been telling me for two, three years that you need an iPhone. I said, I don't want an iPhone. He gets a brand new iPhone every year. He doesn't even put a case on it. Because to be honest, phones look weird with cases. I don't understand why they make phones that way where you need a case on top. Majority of people have cases, right? And the cases cost as much as a phone cost 10 years ago. Cases now cost, I mean, at least for my phone, 50, 60 pounds. You could buy a, pound for, you could buy a phone 10 years ago, 40 pounds. It's just going crazy, the world is, right? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. He told me the last time I met him a few weeks ago, he said, look, I've still got one year old phone. I'm not getting this year. I'm going to get it next year. I said, Alhamdulillah, that's, that's an improvement. <laughs> right? You don't need it. It works. There's nothing new coming out in these phones anymore. They've reached the, they've reached the top anyway, before there were new innovations. But this is what we're getting stuck in. So don't ever get anything because somebody else has got it. And this is a massive problem in our communities. Be yourself. Get it because you need it, if you need it. So be functional in life. Just be functional. Is this functional? Is this practical? Is this needed? That's what you ask yourself, and then you'll be more happy, inshallah. How do you get uh, rid of the hirs of the dunya? The simplest way to get rid of the greed of the world, at least minimize it. When I say get rid of it, we want to minimize it and then get rid of it, right? So, because I don't want to suggest something and then it doesn't go away, and then they think that, hey, that doesn't work. It takes a while, unless, unless sometimes we... We'd, you go through some really special. You, you go through some really special situation, which could be a very bad situation that then teaches us to, uh, the, the 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 you know the, the value of this world basically. But the way to minimize it is just to focus on the hereafter. In the sense that our real life is the hereafter. If I don't get that now and I restrain myself the way the Sahaba did, for example, I'm going to be given a much greater thing in the hereafter. Number one. Number two, I don't really need it. I don't care about what somebody else has. I want to be my own person. I want to defi be defined by myself, not in comparison to another person. So if I need it, I'll get it. If I don't need it, I'm not going to get it. That's the only way you can cut. The only way that you can cut away from this world is to focus on the hereafter, which is a reality for us. The more we focus on the reality, so read a book on, on the hereafter, so that it becomes more clearer about what paradise is what hellfire is, but especially about the delights of paradise. Think about that. And we have a whole series actually, I don't know how many lectures on the great things about paradise, the delights of paradise. It's on our channel, Zamzam Academy channel. You can check it up there. We've also got one that we completed uh, more recently after that on uh, all the descriptions of hellfire as well. So check that out as well. 
but that's the way to focus and really understand the hereafter and the small time that we have in this world and to know that we're just going to be in pain if you get too indulgent in this world and then to develop contentment to develop contentment and satisfaction in what you have may Allah make it easy and ask Allah for satisfaction when you're making I mean th- this question is only coming up uh, based on misunderstanding you know when I said that a lot of the time it's we're Muslims but we misunderstand Allah how can you do dua to Allah and not remember him doing dua to Allah is his remembrance but that means that you don't understand dua I don't know who this person is, so I'm just saying this in general, right? So don't take it personal, but really that's what it is. You haven't understood the philosophy of dua, that's why you're thinking that you're not connected to Allah. Yes, if you're a person, I mean, maybe the question is that, you know, I don't pray, I don't cover, I don't do this, I don't do that, but I'm just going to pray to Allah, right? If that's the question, that has a different answer, okay? The answer to that is, you can still pray to Allah, keep that, do- uh, that window open to Allah. That's still a window to Allah. I don't want to diminish that aspect. Any connection with Allah is a good thing. All right? But you definitely are putting on the AC, you can say, and leaving all the windows open and the doors open and everything else. So it's like, you know, if you want, the, if you want Allah to accept you, you have to show Him, I'm going to do something for you as well. Allah can give you. Allah can give you. And you can disobey Him. But then his giving may not have barakah in it. In the sense that it's not going to give you the satisfaction. Then what's the point of that? It needs to be more holistic. But I will still say you carry on with that window to Allah and you slowly, slowly or fast, fast, try to start becoming a lot more closer to Allah by fulfilling the other obligations. The person who's asked this question definitely has a concern. That's why they're asking this question. They're just waiting for an opening right? of how I can start. So I, I can definitely not say that your dua will not be answered just because you don't. But you're not improving the chances, let's put it that way. I can't dictate Allah. Allah can give who He wants. He knows what's in your heart. But generally speaking, if somebody is disobeying Allah and violating Allah's commands and they're asking on the side, that's just like, I know Allah is very generous, right? But that's not the way to do it. Right? That's not the way to do it. So slowly, slowly start improving, start doing those things and you'll see it. Now the other aspect of the dua is that dua, the Prophet ﷺ called it worship. That used to confuse me. How can dua be worship when we're selfishly asking something? And we see worship and devotion as offering something to Allah. What are you offering to Allah in dua? You're actually asking Him to give you. You're not giving Him anything, are you? But the Prophet ﷺ called it worship. Then I figured out what it really is is that when you ask Allah, it means you realize that only He can give you and nobody else can. And I'm in need of Him. And that is worship. That is an element of worship. So dua is worship. So you are doing some worship. You just need to do more worship. Yeah, that's a big topic, right? Is that if uh, sometimes you, you don't argue back in a dispute and just to keep the family ties and so on, that doesn't mean it's going to go away. Sometimes actually it makes it worse, right? So... I, I, I did not cover that aspect in detail. I was just saying that usually that if you can help it, that you don't want to be doing it, right? However, in that particular scenario, in that situation, you need to find a way to sort it out. So before the next argument ensues, we need to find a way to go and speak to this person. And sometimes some people are, mashallah, very difficult to change. So I know this isn't going to help everybody, but you try to change the person by doing some changing your tact. So having a conversation with them from before that, look, let's just not de- de- do these issues, deal with these issues. Let's just agree to disagree, for example. Or let's resolve it. If you can't do that yourself, try to bring somebody else in to discuss. A third person who can try to solve the issue or at least let the other person know that, look, there's no benefit in having this discord. Sometimes you are dealing with a parent, for example, or a child or a brother or sister that are just nasty. Right? And you just can't change them. Then you just do the best. And that's going to be a practical scenario or just do the best to avoid. Which basically could, I mean, it's just that sometimes a double-edged sword, you just can't win. So one, I would say, is minimize your meeting. It's like go there, pay your respects, say what you have to, you know, do what you have to do and then go and don't sit around for hours. But that's going to become a contention as well then for some people. They don't sit with us. 
Some, some things you just won't win. I don't have an answer to everything. But all I would say is think out of the box to see how you might be able to resolve this or minimize this. Because there's no magic. And make a lot of dua for them. And a dua that helps me a lot. Like if I have a little misunderstanding with somebody, I try to read this dua straight away. Allahumma alif bayna qulubina. Allahumma aslih dhata baynina. Oh Allah, reconcile between our hearts. And reform the matter, the, the affair between us. Reform that matter between us. It helps. It's just there are some people, they just want to be stubborn. They, just, they, they thrive on just being a nuisance. Allah help us. No, yeah, but the thing is that the, but sometimes just being quiet yeah. is not going to help because the other person gets even more angry if you're quiet. They want to fight. You understand what I'm saying? I, I'm just telling you in the various different people who are out there. That's why I said that try to use somebody else to get through to them that look, this is not beneficial. Right? And then make dua for them. So yes, sometimes being quiet definitely helps because the other person just wants to vent. And then once he's vented, he's fine. Now, something interesting that I learned some time ago is that when an event happens to irritate you and the anger that wells up, what that means is essentially is that the cortisol is, re- uh, is, is released in your body. right? So you know when something bad happens, an event that takes place, and you get angry, what that is, that's a release of hormones. They say that that literally lasts for about 90 seconds on average for most people. So after 90 seconds, you should be able to just control yourself. Right? You get over that anger and you control yourself. So you can't carry on and keep being angry uh, with, with those things. But anyway, we're, we're getting off track. The main thing is try another way. Try another way if being silent doesn't help. If being silent helps, great idea. You'll be, you'll be rewarded because one thing that really helps me in any conflict that I have, even though I know I'm right, in, I think I'm right at least, right? That, that's the worst part when you think you're right and then you still want to argue, right? In fact, it's probably worse if you think you're wrong and you still argue. That's the worst part, but most people don't do that. Uh, meaning, they're wrong, but they don't think they're wrong. That's even worse, actually. They're wrong. They don't even think they're wrong. They think they're right. That's the worst part of it. That's compound ignorance. The hadith says that if you leave an argument, an abandoned argument, and you are wrong to start with, which means that it must be somebody who was wrong, who was arguing, then realize, you know what, there's this hadith or heard it afterwards, say, you know what, I better give up, right? They get a house on the outskirts of paradise. On the sides of paradise, they get a house there. They get rewarded, even though they were wrong to start with. And if you're correct and you're on the right anyway, and you still give up arguing when it's not worth it, and to argue, you get a place in the middle of paradise. So that's, the, that's what incentivizes me sometimes to avoid an argument. Right? So keep that in mind, inshallah, that will help. Okay, the last question. And we got a question from a brother here. A simple dhikr regimen that I would, I would suggest that within two, three weeks, you'll, you'll have a level of contentment, inshallah, is a hundred istighfar in the morning, and then 100 in the evening. The benefit of 100 in the morning is that whatever's happened during the night, you get forgiven. Astaghfirullah, 100 times with the, with the consciousness of it. And then in the evening, so that all of our day's misdeeds are gone. Uh, after the 100 istighfar, we follow that up with 100 durud sharif. The benefit of the salawat and the Prophet ﷺ is that once we've purified ourselves with the istighfar, we are seeking blessing. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever seeks sends one blessing on him, Allah will send 10 blessings on them and we need those blessings, right? So we're sending a blessing to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Allah sends us 10 blessings. So that's number two, morning and evening, all right? Number three, La ilaha illallah, some of this Quran reading with at least one or two pages a day with, constant, with a focus on the meaning. Just reflection. And number four is some meditation. This is along with all of the salat and everything you do. Some meditation. Right? So there's multiple types of meditation. Meditation means you're spending five, ten minutes just purely with Allah. No distractions. Takes a long time to get that full concentration. But you do this, right? What you do is you just lower your head. Close your eyes and you lower your head. In fact, you can try it right now for a few seconds. Close, your, uh, close our eyes and lower our head and just imagine that Allah's mercy 
and his light is descending on our heart, that he's showering down, and it's removing all the darknesses from our heart. And once we've thought of that and we've focused on the heart, then we just start imagining that our heart starts to say, Allah, 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 Allah. Just take Allah's name from the heart, not your tongue. You literally sit down and do that for five to seven, ten minutes, and shaitan will distract you like crazy. But once you develop the focus, you'll see the benefit of that. Right? And that's it, just start with that much. And then see how it goes, inshallah. So, Mary Chutti Hogi. Allah bless you guys, man. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. Ameen, Ya Rabb. Ameen. Uh, we're done with those questions, right? From the yeah, sisters? Uh, yeah, there, there's a lot more on this, on this topic on our website, Zamzam Academy, right? Keep us in your duas. Let's make a quick dua. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam. Tabarak fi adil jalali wa ikram. اللهم يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث يا حنان يا منان لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين يا الله have mercy on us oh Allah Allah protect us يا الله bless us and our families protect us and our families especially our children from all of the temptations and the challenges which are out there oh Allah make us good role models for our own children Oh Allah, oh Allah, bless our brothers and sisters around the world. Amen. Oh Allah, remove their afflictions, Amen. their subjugation and oppression. Amen. Oh Allah, grant them their freedom, especially in those our brothers in Palestine. Grant them their freedom, their dignity, their honor. Amen. Oh Allah, oh Allah, accept their martyrs. Amen. And oh Allah, grant steadfastness to those who have been injured and the others. O oh Allah, grant them their resilience. Amen. And O oh Allah, allow us to do that which is correct. Amen. Allow us to do that which is productive in this world, Amen. that is practical in this world. O oh Allah, that is beneficial in this world. O oh Allah, protect us from, our di- from distractions. O oh Allah, from temptations, Amen. from indulgences. Amen. And O oh Allah, from obsessions with Amen. those things that are not right to have obsessions with. O oh Allah, grant us contentment and satisfaction. And O oh Allah, accept us. O oh Allah, accept us. And fulfill and, O oh Allah, improve our spirituality. O oh Allah, revive our dead hearts. O oh Allah, revive our dead hearts. Revive our dead hearts. And O oh Allah, bless and take, uh, O oh Allah, bless this place and take it from strength to strength and protect it. And all of our institution and masajid around the world. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifuna wa salamun al mursaleen wa The point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further, an inspiration an encouragement, persuasion. The next step is to actually start learning seriously, to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam, at least at their basic level, so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, And that's why we started uh, Rayyan courses, so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time, especially, for example, the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essential Certificate, which you take 20 short modules. And at the end of that, inshallah, you will have gotten the, the basics of uh, most of the most important topics in Islam, and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind. You can continue to, leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures, but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.